Okay, so welcome to the drug discovery innovation session this morning. Um, I'm going to lead us off with a little bit of a overview uh, and some future perspectives on um, some, some challenges and some opportunities that I think academic research can contribute to the process of drug discovery, drug development. Uh, we have four speakers this morning after myself. And uh, each of these speakers I'll give a separate little introduction for. The timing of the session um, includes uh, a longer introduction and then shorter talks. I don't actually intend to speak for 30 minutes. So what I thought I would do is we'll see where we are when I finish with my introduction and then we'll divide the remaining extra minutes among the speakers so that if they wish to have a couple of extra minutes or we can have some extra questions with the speakers, then the time can be used that way. Okay. So, I've chosen a few uh, challenges and opportunities that I myself, from my perspective as a chemical biologist, um, have thought about over the years related to drug discovery. And these um, I've uh, decided to, to put to you today as opportunities where academic research can make a real contribution. And these are also topics that are reflected um, by the speakers from today's session. And so there is a clear, uh, uh, evidence decline in the discovery of new molecular entities, um, that is drugs going from discovery platforms to through clinical trials and being approved by uh, the FDA in order to be made available on the market. And that is a definite pattern over the last couple of decades. You may be surprised to hear that we actually don't know all the modes of action and all the molecular targets that the drugs that are on the market actually hits today. A third area of, of concern and opportunity in, involves the evolution of resistance to therapeutics. So uh, it's no surprise to biologists that bacteria over, um, over millennia have adapted to their different environments, um, but in fact, the, the fact that they've adapted over tens of years or even shorter periods of time than that in some cases to the drug environments that we put them in puts that, might, makes us vulnerable to infectious diseases today that we thought were going to be eradicated uh, when people um, first uh, faced the boom of new antibiotics in the 1940s and 50s. But uh, infectious diseases were not we're not cured, and in fact, we are left with many untreatable diseases, and some of them are re-emerging. So this is an area of interest that I think academia has a place to play too, especially since uh, largely uh, large pharmaceuticals have abandoned this area of, of discovery and development. And then finally, an area of opportunity where evolutionary biologists can play a role involves a variation that humans have in terms of our susceptibility to disease and also in terms of how uh, we respond to different treatments. And so we know that both genes and the environment play a role in, um, these, in, the, in susceptibility and in uh, our, our response to treatments, but what kind of roles do they play? Um, and how does that affect the treatments we choose? And what lessons can we learn from evolution to design better drugs? So these are some of the scientific areas of challenge that I think we have that Georgia Tech is well poised to help uh, answer. Now, this is this issue of um, the pipeline of drugs and the decline in the uh, development of new molecular entities um, comes from some very severe constraints in for, for, for the pharmaceutical industry. So uh, this review from two years ago in Nature Review's Drug Discovery proposed that the approximate cost to develop a drug by a typical large pharmaceutical company is now approaching $2 billion. Now that's an astronomical sum to those of us who work in academia. And when we look at the returns of some of those drugs that Andy Mamarius in the earlier session over in IBB this morning talked about $4 million here, eight, or $4 billion here, $8 billion there, those are large revenues as well. But the large cost of, of developing these products and the many molecules that fall out of the pipeline um, in the process have led drug companies to be understandably cautious um, and to look for ways to cut costs. Uh, the, the problem, the result of a number of different factors, one of which are these high costs, but also include regulatory uh, changes over the years, have been that we now, um, in the last um, half decade, had fewer new molecular entities make it through to approval by the FDA than in the previous five years, and those numbers were already low. Uh, so Andy Mamari showed some nice data uh, about an hour ago also that showed that he talked about where um, the heyday of developing and approving new drugs seemed to hit a, a maximum around the 70s and 80s where 40 to 50 new drugs were being approved a year and we're down into the 20s now. And when you look of, at a typical year, 2009, 24 new FDA approved drugs, 
only four of those were first in class. That means that they were the first molecules of a certain molecular class to hit a new kind of molecular target. And uh, those are really the kinds of discoveries that the drug industry would like to see and that academics are well poised to make. Now, so academics are uh, naturally interested in how molecules work because we're naturally interested in how life works and life is based on molecules. So one of the examples of how academic research can contribute to the process of drug discovery involves the research being conducted here at Georgia Tech in Wendy Kelly's lab, who will be the first speaker this morning. And so she's interested in the genes that are encoded in bacteria that allow the production of interesting peptide-based molecules that function as antibiotics and may also uh, be useful to treat other diseases. And some of the excitement of this approach is that the, the biosynthetic engineering angle of it allows us to be able to manipulate or allows her to be able to manipulate these pathways to make new drugs, molecules that have never been seen before, um, and then to un try to understand how they're made. Can we make them more cheaply? Can we engineer bacteria to make them? So, um, and also, can we understand how they work? And the kinds of molecules that are the results, some of which are a little bit large to really necessarily be a great drug on the market, but give us some really great insights into the pharmacophore about what could be a great drug, represent structural types that are not typically available through very simple combinatorial library types of approaches for the production of molecules. So these natural products that are made by bacteria um, go beyond the imagination of many of us in terms of the chemical synthesis we might do um, and give us new ideas about molecules that we could synthesize or that we could explore the genetic basis for in order to see what kinds of roles they play. And another way of developing new molecular entities is to study particular pathways and ask the question about what molecules affect these pathways. And in the Oyelari lab here at Georgia Tech, and we're going to hear a talk from one of his senior graduate students, Berkeley Grider, in this session, they are interested in developing uh, small molecules that are uh, useful to, um, in terms of binding to hormone receptors and also in terms of acting as inhibitors for crucial enzymes that act in various pathways related to cancer, such as the uh, histone deacetylases. So we're going to hear more about um, the work in the Oyelari lab as well this morning. Now, I'm not going to be giving a, a larger talk, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of the kinds of discovery activities that we do in my lab. We're interested in discovering uh, new molecular uh, classes of, of natural products that are made by marine organisms whose biosynthetic genes are unique, that have not been studied uh, by chemists in the past, and whose biological roles are unknown. And so we're especially interested in looking for new macrocyclic type molecules that could form um, a basis for exploring a new framework works of structural types and to uh, look for potential treatments, especially for diseases um, that are important in developing countries, diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, um, some of the other infectious diseases involving pathogenic bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus and drug-resistant E. coli, um, as well as different forms of cancer. Now, Related to the need to discover new molecular entities is the challenge of trying to understand how these molecules work in a complex biological system like the human body. And so this is an area where chemical biology has a big role to play. We can explore how small molecule drugs can interact with uh, cells in the body by creating tagged versions of the drug and interrogating the cells uh, histologically and looking to see what kinds of uh, cellular components are affected by these drugs. And also we can use these kinds of tagged approaches to isolate the, the proteins that are interacting with these um, small molecules. And these proteins um, are molecular targets that can allow us to make the next generation of hypotheses about modes of actions of these drugs. One thing that's been a surprise to many uh, chemists and biologists is that actually there are drugs on the market for which we don't understand their full effects on the human body. So for example, one of the most important anti-malarial drugs used today is artemisinin, the artemisinin class of natural products um, that have been used actually as folk medicines for many generations and have been on the market in China since the 1970s and in North America for a couple of decades. This is a crucial class of anti-malarial agents, but it's only in the last five years that people have actually gotten further in understanding the mode of action, and it's still not fully understood. It's an area of very active debate in the literature. Now, in terms of understanding modes of action and molecular targets of drugs, 
um, processes that people have chosen. So if, uh, in this case here, I'm showing you an example of a ch chemical genetic approach to try to identify new molecular targets of small molecule drugs. And in this uh, paper from 2006 by uh, Charlie Boone's lab at the University of Toronto, they uh, looked at the ways that different small molecule drugs affected a library of yeast and this, this library of yeast cells where each, each uh, strain of yeast was deficient in a different set of pathways. And when they treated the different uh, yeast strains with all these different 85 different drug-like molecules, they found that they could, um, ask, they could confirm the mode of action and the molecular target of known drugs, but they could also see evidence that there were molecular targets of these drugs that were previously unknown, even for well-used drugs like tamoxifen, which is an important treatment for breast cancer. So they were able to uncover that tamoxifen actually had additional molecular targets. These are things that in a lot of cases in the clinic, people would think of them as being side effects. But in fact, we don't often know what the pathways are that are being attacked by these drugs. And in order to be able to utilize these drugs, perhaps find new treatments for old drugs, or perhaps better anticipate side effects and better minimize side effects, understanding at a systems biology level the entire effect of these drugs on uh, cellular pathways is really important. Okay, so I named five total challenges and areas of opportunity, and I'm clustering the last two together, um, and those are the evolution of resistance to therapeutics and the human variation and susceptibility both to disease and to treatments. And I'm, the reason I'm clustering them together is conceptually they share a common theme. They relate to evolution. And the consideration of evolution is something that biologists are very good at and that we have a unique role to play in terms of uh, proposing new therapeutics for the future. When it comes to the evolution of resistance, um, it's well understood that pathogens, uh, especially microbes like bacteria uh, that have very short generation times, are very quick to adapt to antibiotics. And unfortunately, we have not kept up with the effort towards the discovery of new antibiotics to replace the ones that we've lost over the decades. Um, yet, by understanding how bacteria pick up new genes, um, new traits that encode resistance to antibiotics, and by understanding how evolution acts on these traits, we are in a better position to develop drugs uh, that could hit new targets that could withstand uh, the resistance uh, pathways of known bacteria and that could allow us to make headway in this area. So this is an area where geneticists and microbiologists working together and considering the ecology of the human system and the ecological environment in which antibiotics act can make a big difference in trying to circumvent antibiotic resistance. Now, for those of us who are over the age of 40, we understand very well that our bodies were not really made to last. In fact, our bodies are not ideally designed or even designed at all. And um, we often feel that we're lucky just to be able to make it with the bodies that we have and to be able to get as far as we get. We also might assume that human evolution has taken us to some kind of wholly adapted endpoint that represents the 21st century. And that doesn't make any sense when you consider that time is still going to go on without us. So in fact, what we see here when we look around the room is a snapshot of where evolution has taken us in terms of human history to date. And hopefully, for our, our descendants' sake, it will have a long history into the future. So knowing that we're on a trajectory that isn't really designed by anything, it, it is based upon random mutations that can be selected for or that can be carried along for the ride by genetic drift, we wonder if maybe it's possible that there are some traits that were present in other uh, times, so in, in our ancestors, that might have been actually useful had those traits made it to the current time. Okay, so this is a fairly uh, original line of thinking that Eric O'Shea's lab is taking in order to recapitulate our genetic history by comparing the genomes of currently existing organisms, looking back and proposing what metabolism and pathways and cellular machinery might these organisms have had in the very distant past and whether or not there are any genes that were present then that encode proteins that would be useful to us today. And that even has a role in human history, or sorry, in, in drug development, and Eric is gonna tell us about that today. Finally, um, human traits um, are a product of genes and the environment. They affect our susceptibility to disease. It is only recently that with 
the population level genomics were individual human variation in susceptibility to disease and in effectiveness of treatment can be studied that we can actually understand which people are likely to benefit from certain treatments and which treatments might best match certain populations of people. And so our, uh, one of our speakers, our third speaker today will be Greg Gibson who will speak on this theme.